I recognize that in the book of Revelation, there is a reference to kingdom worship. And in the concept that we have that is awaiting us, when the millennial reign of Christ begins in Jerusalem at shortly after his second coming, there will be a huge temple created where he will sit and rule from Jerusalem, rule over the entire world. That temple is described in Ezekiel from chapter 40 to chapter 48. That's a lot of chapters, and it's dedicated to the temple. In Revelation chapter 20, shortly after Armageddon, he's returned. We find in the first three verses that Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. Then the millennial reign begins with verse 4. And it says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead or upon their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be, catch this word, priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. For a thousand years. And verse 7 begins talking about the end of the thousand years. All of Revelation from chapter 1 to chapter 19 is preparing us for the second return of Christ and the creation of the millennial reign of the Lord on earth. And when we read about it, it's three verses in chapter 20. That's all you get. Three little short verses talking about folks ruling and reigning with Christ. Oh, where's all the rest of the goodies? Oh, I want to know a little bit more. We spent 19 chapters with stuff that is absolutely heaven and earth shaking events, cataclysms beyond belief. Then when it gets time to talk about the good stuff, it's yeah, it happens more or less. I would like to know a little more. Wouldn't you? Yeah. What's going to happen? It's kind of bewildering. But thankfully, there's more to learn from other books. Isaiah has a lot to say about the millennial period of time. Amos, Habakkuk, Zechariah. And then we come to Ezekiel, where we will be reading from his book tonight. The old prophet in these chapters... From chapter 40 to chapter 48, the old prophet has visions of this massive temple. At the end of his descriptions, the very last verse where he concludes his book, he says, after all of this immaculate description of this huge structure, he says, the name of the city shall be Jehovah Shama. It's one of the seven Jehovah names, the divine names that God has revealed himself to let us know about who he is. That phrase, Jehovah Shama, sums up everything that makes that massive temple important. He says, the Lord is there. That's what makes this temple special. The Lord is there. The world will come to worship him face to face. They will hear his voice. They will see his smile. And it'll be all worth it. 
on that day. Chapter 44, where I'm taking you tonight, in the middle of these eight chapters, is a parenthesis. He stops talking about the construction of the building and starts talking about the worship practices of the priests and the people. And it's controversial as to, is this happening during the thousand year millennial reign or has it happened in the past? And none of the commentators agree. And what we find in reading these verses is rather disturbing. We find the people coming to the church, if I may switch terms, to the temple, seeking their own desires. We find the priests fulfilling the desires of the people, giving them what they want to hear. And that's disturbing to think about that the people turn the church into something for them. And the preachers want to be popular, so they agree and give the people what they want to hear. That's why it's thought maybe that this chapter is kind of out of place. Mm. This chapter uniquely is for, if I may say, four pastors Four worship leaders, four Bible teachers to warn them. Your purpose is not to please the people completely. Your purpose is to please the Lord. To preach the word of God without what? Fear or favor of men. But there is something about these verses and these warnings that I find highly important for us. Especially for many of you like me who have spent decades upon decades serving the Lord and have been told what we really need to do in order to be in service for the Lord. And now in our senior twilight years, it gets pretty hard to fulfill all of those requirements that we've been told we need to do. So we're going to see tonight something I think that's extraordinary. For all of us to learn. There's two phrases that you'll find in these uh, passages that we're going to read. One of them is, is ministry to the house. And the other one is ministry to the Lord. What is being stated here is that the priests and their activities are doing a work. That really is applicable to the house and not to the Lord himself. And there's another group who are ministering specifically to the Lord and not to the house. There's a difference, friends, between the structure and the person to whom the structure is devoted. We're going to see three focus groups. First is the people come into church. Coming with their sacrifices, coming with their offerings, coming with their grocery list of needs, coming with their worship, coming with their families to the house of God. Another focus group are the priests who stand at the great altar, who perform the daily sacrifices for the people who bring their sacrificial sacrificial offerings, bring their animals, bring their money, bring their devotion, bring their prayers. And the priests are there to receive them and perform the work for them. That is their part in the worship practices to the Lord. Then we find a third group. This third group is in the temple itself. They are the ones who are lighting the menorah, putting the bread on the table, making sure that the table of incense, the altar, is constantly flowing with the incense. The the, the lights are constantly lit and lit. And that the bread is constantly fresh. They are in the inner court. So we have two places. The outer court where all the people and the priests are with the altar. And the inner court where there is just the menorah, the bread, and the incense. There shouldn't be either ors in our service for the Lord. Either you do one thing or you do the other. Some of us have grown up in churches that are, if I may say, dedicated to teaching God's word. And they tell you, all you need is the word. There are ministers today 
who do not believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit as we do, and who preach that the word is all you need, and that all of the gifts and the talk about the Holy Spirit was all for the days of the apostles and weren't carried on to this day. 2,000 years later, they don't apply to us, which tells me they worship the great I was instead of the great I am, who said, I change not. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, make your choice. They think that all you need is the word. But may I say the disciples had the living word and walked with him for three and a half years. And you couldn't have more of the word than the 12 disciples did. But when they led Jesus away to be crucified, they all took off and hid for fear of the Pharisees. So apparently being with the word for three and a half years wasn't enough. We have others that say we need the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to concentrate on more than anything else. But the Corinthian church to which Paul really wrote four letters, which we have combined and made two letters out of. They were the worst church Paul had to deal with. And they were over full with the spirit. Everything was going just like clockwork. But they had problems that he had to straighten out. And he tells them in one of the chapters, that's enough for writing about your mistakes. Now I'll deal with the rest of it when I get there. But you decide whether I come with love or a club. All right. <laughs> Hello. What we need is the word and the spirit. When the disciples obeyed the word from Jesus and went to Jerusalem and tarried for 10 days and fasted and prayed and waited and waited, the Holy Spirit came. Combined with the word of obedience, the church was born in a day, 3,000 received Christ, and the explosion of the gospel message began to flow. Now, what I'm going to say may sound one-sided to you as I speak tonight, but if you'll stay with me, when I get to the end, the word of God will round it out. Let us take a look at Ezekiel chapter 44, beginning with verse 4. He speaks of an angelic being who is carrying him from place to place. And he opens up. Then brought he me by way of the north gate before the house. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And I fell on my face. I think it's something that we need to notice that when someone comes across an angel or the Lord or the presence of the Lord that instead of pulling out their phone and taking a selfie, they fall on their face and worship. There's a lot of people that would see an angel and just a minute, let me get my camera here and take a picture of the two of us together. And then they would try to get on TV. I saw him. This is the response of the people who really come face to face with divinity. They fall on their face. Verse five. And the Lord said unto me, son of man, mark well. Now that phrase mark well is very important in the Hebrew. It means make it a part of you. Graft it into your very being. Mark well. Behold with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say unto you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all the laws thereof. And mark well, again, he says it, the entering into the house and every going forth of the sanctuary. He's wanting Ezekiel to grasp on to. What concerns him, get immersed into it, care about it, see what's going on and let it grip your very being as it has gripped mine. One of the things that I see God doing with many of his prophets is he intimately approaches them with a concern that he has and he's looking for somebody who will care. 
as much as he cares. He wants somebody to be concerned about the things he's concerned about. And I have found in the past, if I can zone in on that issue, whatever it is he wants to reveal to me, that really is important to him. If I make it important to me, he'll take care of my needs. I don't have to worry and be concerned or fret over what it is that concerns me. I can leave him at the altar and focus my attention on what he cares about. And he'll take care of me. Behold, all the ordinances of the house and the laws and the people coming in and catalog them and mark them down and pay attention to what's being done. Jesus did that. Did you know he did that when he was here on earth? It says that he stood by the offering plate and he watched as the people brought their offerings. <laughs> kind of looking over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, you put in a buck. I saw you. I saw you crumple that up and sneak it into the bag real quick so nobody would notice that you only gave a quarter. Then he sees the widow lady. She had a choice. She had two coins. She gave both of them. She could have kept one back. But she did something that God is looking for all of us to do. She threw her entire wealth, her entire possession into God's hands, knowing, frankly, what she had in her hands wasn't going to be enough. But if she gave it all to God, God would give his all to her. And he did. And Jesus recognized her. And to this day, remember what that widow woman did. She trusted God with all that she had. You can trust me too, he says. Verse 6. And thou shalt say to the rebellious. Uh Uh-oh. This is where it gets kind of controversial. Is this in the middle of the the millennial kingdom? The rebellious? I don't know. I'm just going to leave it where it is. And presume God knows what he's talking about in the middle of the millennial reign, that there's going to be some that rebel. You know, the book of Zechariah says there is. It says some nations will not come to worship. And it says for a reward, God's going to dry up the heavens. They won't get any rain. And when they plant seed, it won't germinate. He has power over the seeds to make it germinate or not. And it says he's not going to let it happen. Until they come back to worship him. Surprise. During the millennial reign. There's going to be some people that disobey. With Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Mm. Bet you never heard that about the millennial reign. Have you? Mm. (laughs) It's going to happen. The rebellious and say to the house of Israel. Israel. You're familiar with that term. Are you not? Prince that has power with God. At its root. It means God governed. And if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian tonight, your God is the one who governs over you. So what we're reading is for you, too. Thus says the Lord, O house of Israel, let it suffice you. In essence, what he's saying there, enough is enough. Let it suffice you of all your abominations. That's kind of a heavy word, don't you think? Abominations? That's kind of serious. Well, what was their abominations? Verse 7. And that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh. This was Paul's message. He was condemning and criticizing these Jews who, because they were circumcised in their flesh, thought they had accomplished what God wanted accomplished. And there wasn't anything more for them to do. And he says, I would that you were circumcised in your hearts as devoted and as committed to serving God in your heart like you say you are in your flesh. God speaking to Isaiah said, the people draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is what God is complaining about. This is what Jesus complained about. And this is what Ezekiel is talking about. 
uncircumcised in their heart, uncircumcised in their flesh. Worse, these people are not even members of the covenant blessing. They're not children of the seed of Abraham. To be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, to offer up my bread and the fat and the blood. They have broken my covenant because of all of their abominations. What was happening? The people were hiring preachers that they wanted to have serve them. We want you to preach a certain way. We want to hear a certain message. We want to sing a certain way. We want to sacrifice a certain way. And we want you to do it. And if you don't do it, we'll find somebody that will. We don't care what his background is. Just do it our way. Verse 8. For you have not kept charge of my holy things. You have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. In short, what Ezekiel is saying is that the people have taken the house of God and the actions of God, the worship of God and the teaching of God and turned it into something for themselves that they would be ministered to in the messages that they want to hear. Stroke their back, scratch their itch, tickle their ears, send them on their way. I'm okay. You're okay. Off we go. We're okay. That's not anything different than what Jesus would said would happen in the last days. The church of Laodicea is the same way. They become rich. They become popular. They become accepted of the world. They've expanded their borders and they have pushed out the walls. And when it comes to time to worship, they can't even hear Jesus, who is not even in the church anymore. He's on the outside of the church, knocking on the door, seeking admittance. When he says, I stand at the door and knock, he's not talking to sinners. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to his own people. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will hear me and open the door. I will come in and I will fellowship with him and he with me. Thus says the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary. And then verse 10. And the Levites. We talking about the people. Now we talk about the priests. The priests, seeing the popularity that they had dwindle away, decided, you know what? If we want the crowd, if we want to make sure we get our income and pad our retirement fund, we better get the people back in here paying the light bill and paying for our new boat. (laughs) So the Levites have also gone away from me, he says in verse 10. When Israel went astray, the Levites pursued them and said, "Oh, oh, wait a minute, we'll do what you want. We'll teach what you want to hear. Verse 11, yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary. Even with all of this rebelliousness, even with all of this pursuit to turn God's house into a place that the people wanted to serve them. God says, nonetheless, I will let these priests minister in my house, having charge at the gates of my house. And ministering to the house. Now catch this. This is what they're doing in the ministry. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them, the people. And shall minister unto them, the people. And jumping down to verse 13 Talking about these same Levites, God says, they shall not come near me. Go ahead and do the work of sacrifice of burnt offering and sacrifice for the people. God has a habit in the Old Testament. When he talks about the sacrifices that the people are supposed to pursue in order to worship him, honor him and draw near to him. When he talks about them, he always starts with what's close to him. And then he works backwards to what's close to them. And then when he tells them to perform it, 
he starts with what's closest to them and has them work towards him. So this is what we have. It's reversed. Slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. The sacrifice for the people was the offering that you bring to gain forgiveness of your sins. This is the ministry of soul winning. It is what he says here is ministry to the house, not ministry to him. Soul winning is a worthy ministry. It is an important ministry. If it weren't for soul winning, I wouldn't be one. You wouldn't be one. Is it important? Very important. We're not putting it down. But as I said, either ors in the house of God, he is letting us know that soul winning is a ministry of the house. You come in with your offering. You declare you're a sinner. The transfer of your sins goes to the animal that's slain. The animal is slain. Your sins are forgiven. You repeat the process next year. For Christians, it's coming to the cross. It's saying the sinner's prayer at the end of a sermon. It's getting your life right with God. A worthy, important, vital ministry in the church. Secondly, you slay the burnt offering. That's the one that's closest to him. What is that one about? Slaying the burnt offering is giving your sacrificial offering and placing it on the altar and it is totally consumed. That burnt offering is the same thing that Paul was saying in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You dedicate your total self to God. As Jesus said, you want to be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow me. You die to yourself daily. Completely committed. Completely devoid of passions, desires, and wants, and wishes. Focused completely and totally on him. That's the burnt offering. Those are the two sacrifices. Both of them. Important ministries. Both of them. Ministries to the house. Both of them are done in the outer court where the altar is. You don't slay the animal in the inner court. You do it in the outer court. What happens with the people? They come for miles around. Joseph Parker, he said, if you preach suffering and pain, you'll never lack for an audience. You'll always have people coming. Here's the five point solution to your problem. Here's the three step process to get out of your pain. Here's the 12 step process for you to get out of your addictions. You will always have people lined up for blocks around who want that help. It's ministry to the house. All outer court, all of it seen work. Yet God says, they shall not come near me. Now he turns to the third group. First was the people. Second was the Levites who pursued the people. And now, verse 15, Ezekiel 44. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Who was Zadok? He was the high priest when David was king. When Absalom rose up, and rebelled against David, and David fled from Jerusalem off into the caves. Zadok, the high priest, grabbed up all the furniture in the temple and followed after David. That's God's anointed man. He's our king. He's our worship leader. 
He's the sweet singer of Israel. We're going to follow him. And we're bringing all the worship elements with us when we do. David turned out and came to Zadok and loved him. Adored him. Dear friend, take it all back. Because these are not my elements. They are God's elements. And Jerusalem is his city. And these are there to worship him, not to worship me. Zadok was faithful. He stayed faithful to David all the way up to the end of his days. They, God says in these verses, they shall come near to me. How do we worship God? The same steps that they took. You stop whatever it is that you're involved in. Whatever activities, whatever religious busyness has captured your attention and caused you to throw all that you are into doing something religious. You leave it behind and you go to God. The psalmist said, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You come into God's presence with praise. Just quit doing what you're doing and go to him. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door. This tells us something. What these priests of Zadok were doing was behind the veil. Nobody saw it. There was no opportunity for them to wave. Look at me over here helping God. Look at me over here blessing the Lord. I'm worshiping him and praising him. See me? None of that. And that might be the reason why God said they can't be seen in what they're doing. They're not going to be deluded with pride in wanting to be seen. And I prefer this one. This is the one they can come near me. This is the one I will bless. This is the one I will anoint. This is the one I will strengthen and receive. And he says, they shall stand in my presence. So when you come to the Lord, you stick around. You have your own personal little linger longer in God's presence. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the stories of Joshua. He was a general under Moses. And many times we find Moses, who was a Levite, and his brother Aaron, also a Levite, would go into the Holy of Holies and get instructions from God. They would walk in. They would do what they needed to do. They would wait on the Lord. The Lord would talk to them. They would converse with one another for a message. They would go back out and present the message from God to the people. And several times you will see when they leave, it adds this little statement. Joshua was in the tent watching it. He was there when they went in. He was there when they talked to God. He was there when God talked to them. He was there when they formulated what they were going to say. And he was there when they left to go tell the people. He didn't want to leave the presence of God. And God rewarded him with being in charge of the people when Moses had passed. He knew who he wanted. A guy who would listen to him. A guy who would spend time with him. Someone who thought more of being in the presence of God than being in the presence of anyone else. You stay for a while. You offer adoration and worship and praise to the living God. You come into his presence with thanksgiving. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Washed me in your cleansing flow. And now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious. Amen. Worthy. Amen. Worthy Amen. is the Lamb. Woo. You bless Him. Adore Him. Magnify Him. Woo. You and Him. 
This is the message I want to bring to you. God chose the ministry of the priests of Zadok to be the one that he preferred. He put a priority on those who would concentrate on loving him more than on those who were performing the busyness of the church. Oh, the grace of God that he would choose the one thing that all of us can do. Not all of you have been asked to come teach. Not all of you have been asked to come lead worship. But all of you have been asked to come into his presence and glorify his holy name. Lift him up and worship and adore him who reigns forever and ever. You can be a priest of Zadok. Do I have another story about how that is true? In the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, he entered into a certain village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations and she came up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Well, Mary was sitting right there. And she's talking to Jesus, giving him a piece of her mind. Mm hmm. Tell her to help me. Well, she asked for it. She gets it. The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Lord says your name twice. You best be listening. You are worried and bothered about so many things. But only a few things are necessary and really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. The busyness of the church or being at his feet. Do you realize that at the end of that, it goes to another story? Nowhere does it say that Martha apologized. Whoops. She didn't stop working. She went back to doing her busyness. And she didn't join Mary at the feet of Jesus. God puts a priority on ministry to himself. Now, I want to wrap this up by telling you there is more to it. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Many of us have grown up in church. And we have... Honestly, ask God, what's your will for me? I want to know what you want me to do. I listen to Dennis Prager all the time, and he says, most of my prayers is just asking God what he wants me to do. I don't know how many times I've heard people seeking the will of the Lord. How do I get it? Acts chapter 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord. What are we talking about? Ministering like the, the priests of Zadok, ministering to the Lord. Not ministry to the house, ministry to him. Minister to the Lord and check this and fasted. You know what? The only time I ever remember fasting is when I wanted something. I want to show you, God, how really I want what I'm asking you for. I'm going to go without cheeseburgers. <laughs> oh boy, I go out without cheeseburgers. I'm serious. I don't think I have ever once fasted to minister to him, to go without, just to tell him I love him. When Della was in Bible college, the kids at the Bible college had one song they sang all the time. I didn't come here to ask you for anything. I just came to talk with you, Lord. Maybe tomorrow. There will be heartaches and sorrows. 
and a thousand teardrops may fall. But until I face tomorrow's task, I have no special favor to ask. I just came to talk with you, Lord. They ministered unto the Lord and fasted. And then the Holy Ghost fell and spoke to them and said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have chosen them to do. And they fasted and prayed some more. They laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them away on Paul's first missionary journey. I assure you that when you wholeheartedly and completely and totally immerse yourself into God's presence, he'll tell you what his will is for your life. That's why Jesus says, come away with me, my beloved, and learn of me. I am meek and lowly. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And he proclaimed to the whole world, this is life eternal. That a man, that a woman would know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's life eternal. Is it any wonder that he says many will come and say, I have done this grocery list of things for you. I have worked for you. I have healed for you. I've raised the dead. And he says, I never knew you because they never took the time to be with him and have a personal relationship with him. May I say it one more time? The grace of God to us is the one thing that he considers the most important ministry every one of us can do. Every one of us could do it. No exceptions. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace.